And there's a quote from Plato. The essence of what Plato said was that for one to understand the earth upon which we live, they must rise to the very edges of the atmosphere and beyond, for only then will they understand. Space tourism gives us the opportunity to deliver on Plato's thought. Commercial space flights delivering an era of unprecedented innovation at warp speed. Seeing the Earth from space, it shocked me. It will always stay with me. But space flight is extremely risky. Realistically, you're having a relatively inexperienced, untrained crew fly in a very dangerous mission for the very first time. There's a lot that can go wrong there. In the United States, there have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Yes, indeed. Few regulations protect today's civilian astronauts, and critics say company safety standards lack transparency. If I ask you about Blue Origin, SpaceX, or Virgin Galactic safety standards, you would essentially say, we have no I can't idea. I tell you. Yeah, I, we have no idea. Welcome to the webcast for the Inspiration4 mission as our four civilian astronauts will orbit the Earth for three days before splashing down in the Atlantic Ocean. This is the first all-civilian mission to orbit. Copy, one alpha. Vehicles pitching downrange. Inspiration 4 crew are now on their way to space. It changed my life. I think about it all day, every day. I didn't expect to be so impacted by seeing our planet. Especially we had this giant window, this cupola window that I could put my whole body into and see the entirety of Earth in front of me with the blackness of space around it. It was so alive and vibrant and it stayed with me. It'll always stay with me. It was a very smooth ride. Excited, nervous? Oh my gosh, I was so excited. I just said, let's do this. Even during launch, at one point I was just laughing because I was having so much fun. I think you can see it on my face. Like, my mouth is wide open. I was just having the best time. The best amusement ride Oh, ever. yes. Right? It was so exhilarating. It was faster for me to get to space than it is for me to get to work. <laughs> How did you get hooked up into Inspiration4? I get this email from St. Jude, my employer, and they said they wanted to speak to me about a unique opportunity. So I joined this call, and they start telling me about a new fundraiser for the hospital, which would be a mission to space called Inspiration4. I was incredibly lucky. I think I'm one of the only people in the world to ever get a phone call out of the blue saying, do you want to go to space? On September 15th, 2021, Haley Arsenault and three other civilians lifted off in a privately chartered SpaceX flight for three days in Earth orbit. It was a space first, no professional astronauts on board. Arsenault was 29, the youngest American ever in space. This childhood cancer survivor was also the first astronaut with a prosthesis. And how did they pick you? I was a St. Jude patient as a kid. I had bone cancer when I was 10 and spent a year undergoing therapy at St. Jude in Memphis and just fell in love with the place. So much so that I, I made it my life mission to work for the hospital. They knew my passion for the hospital. And I think they also knew I was kind of adventurous. So when, that, when they asked if I wanted to go to space, I was shocked. I said, okay, yes. Let me check with my mom, but yes. And uh, and I just remember getting off the phone and looking at my hands and they were just shaking. But it wasn't like you had to think long about it. As soon as they asked me to go, it's like I wanted nothing more in the entire world. Arsenault's opportunity flew against the history of humans in space. Since the first crewed American space flight in 1961, nearly 670 people have gone to space, and only 49 were private citizens on U.S. commercial flights. But that number could rise exponentially in the coming decade. I would say that we're in the middle of a very significant transformation between a time in which almost Everything that happened in space was done by the government to a time in which private industry is playing an increasingly important role. So industry has always been involved, but it was as a contractor. Now it's not the taxpayers funding these missions. It's not the government deciding what they should look like or even what the mission is. The pyramid is inverted. It is. Today, billionaires Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Richard Branson are major players 
but others are joining this new space race. How do you project the trajectory going forward for the next, let's say to the end of the decade? I think we're gonna see continued growth in commercial space, and that will include not only things like suborbital space tourism, expect to see several commercial space stations. One of the things that I'm most excited about is something that is often called point-to-point -point transportation through space. That's gonna be a huge game changer, I believe, and frankly, open up space to a lot more people and have it be a part of our everyday life. So what can a commercial space flight look like? For the Inspiration4 team, that three-day orbital flight took them 360 miles above Earth. Orbital space flights require the craft to reach a high enough velocity to remain in orbit. Suborbital flights, however, don't achieve orbital speeds, are shorter in duration, and require significantly fewer resources. They're likely to become more accessible as space tours. A third type of space tour flies much lower than suborbital flights, but provides similar visuals. The space tourism market will skyrocket in the coming years. An analysis found globally, space tourism was worth nearly $600 million in 2021, but is expected to rise to nearly $13 billion by 2031. There's a quote from Plato. The essence of what Plato said was that for one to understand the earth upon which we live, they must rise to the very edges of the atmosphere and beyond, for only then will they understand. Ryan Hartman is the CEO of Worldview Enterprises. His company uses high altitude helium balloons to collect data and images from the stratosphere. In August 2023, Worldview launched the Armis mission, a balloon carrying a set of instruments to collect weather data up to 14 miles above Earth. But Hartman has aspirations to send up not just tools, but humans too. Space tourism, in my opinion, gives us the opportunity to deliver on Plato's thought. That for us to understand our Earth, we have to rise to the very edge of the atmosphere and beyond. How as a company do you evolve from a high altitude ballooning company to a spacefaring company? Well, I, 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 they're related. You know, when I think about the role that a remote sensing business plays, part of it is becoming experts of the stratosphere. I believe that that ultimately enables us to deliver this experience in a curated way that's safe, that's responsible, and ultimately you know, provides a repeatable experience that we can do hundreds of times per year. Some technology Worldview needs to operate doesn't exist on the market, so they build some parts in-house. On one side, we have all of the electronics components, manufacturing, and on the other side is where we do all of the integration. You know, the reality is, is we have to train people to do the work that we do here because it doesn't exist. And there may be jobs in this room in 10 years that do not exist today. Yeah, for sure there will be. I mean, there's gonna be things that we learn and things that we know we have to do that we don't know today. This is the balloon farm. So this is where we manufacture all of our stratospheric balloons. And so if it's one of our future space tourism balloons, it'll be the length of this table. I mentioned it's 17.5 million cubic feet, but that, that translates to a linear length of about 600 feet long. So two football fields long, uh, wow. the balloon is. When we bring space tourism to the marketplace at scale, uh, we'll do 500 to 700 flights per year in space tourism. 500 to 700 flights? Yes. Wow. Per year. That's ambitious. Yes. This is a full-size mock-up of the Explorer space capsule. We often talk about what we're selling is a view, right? And so the window has to be perfect. Uh, uh, you have to be able to design a window uh, that is safe for operating in space, but also delivers the promise of an inspired perspective. What's been the demand? Well, you know, it's been surprising. So today we've sold a little more than 1,250 tickets, and we're seeing that demand continue to rise. Worldview plans to operate seven launch sites to send tourists flying for a few hours above unique wonders of the world, landing in a zone near the launch point. The price, $50,000. The first year of the Grand Canyon tour is sold out. There is a significant difference in responsibility when people That's are right. going up. Uh, I, I, uh, yes, I, and it's, it's something that uh, uh, I think we all uh, take very seriously. We're selling an opportunity to view our Earth from on high. The rest of it should be very 
you know, benign to uh, our customers. You know, it, it should be that they have you know, all the confidence in the world that we've done all of the right things necessary to make this the safest possible way to view our Earth. You know, and that is a significant burden to carry. That is a significant responsibility that we have. But space, with its unforgiving conditions, involves undeniable risk for any space tourist. In the United States, there have been roughly 400 flights that had a person on board. There have been four fatal accidents. In 1967, the pilot was killed on a suborbital X-15 flight. In 1986, seven astronauts died aboard the space shuttle Challenger. In 2003, seven more were killed on space shuttle Columbia. And in 2014, the co-pilot was killed on a Virgin Galactic Spaceship Two test flight. That's a 1% fatal accident rate, which is pretty high. So it is risky. 1% disaster rate. I mean, if you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Yes, indeed. There are countless safety considerations when it comes to spaceflight. Operator Solutions is a company addressing one of them, search and rescue. Here, they're simulating a rescue effort. My sense, just watch this. You would not want to be doing this for the first time in an actual crisis. No, absolutely okay. not. No, th th something like this requires a lot of training, not just on our side, but also on the survival member side. Because remember, they just had some sort of an in-flight abort or some sort of an, a contingency. So everything has already gone bad for them, right? You want to be able to do it in a controlled, calm environment with professionals in a safe environment. Once you understand what you're working with, then it's much easier to stay focused under pressure. No federal requirement currently exists for any commercial spaceflight company to have a search and rescue plan in place. During NASA's space shuttle program, Air Force Pararescue Men, also known as PJs, were the dedicated recovery team to perform search and rescue missions in the case of an emergency. But the Department of Defense has no obligation to save private astronauts. Of the three founders of Operator Solutions, two are pararescue men including Brandon Doherty, its CEO. What goes through your mind from a risk standpoint? Commercially, what, I, what I'm most concerned with in, in the human beings that are going into the capsules is that they're not trained to the same level of the NASA astronauts. Realistically, you're having a relatively inexperienced, untrained crew fly in a very dangerous mission for the very first time, and there's a lot that can go wrong there. How does Operator Solutions make space tourists safer? Number one, preventative. If we can teach these crew members how to correctly survive, how to cor correctly signal, how to use their radio, how to use their survival equipment, then if they find themselves in a situation, they can better execute that. The other, the other aspect of it is we provide rescue coverage. So if something were to go bad, we put experts on them right away in a very custom tailored fashion. Without regulation, unless it's required, will it just be up to private companies to step in and say, we need the help here. You know, you don't want to over-regulate. So I, I do believe that it will be up to the commercial industry to fill in the gaps. When it comes to regulation, the enforcement of regulation in space travel, today, what is it that the FAA is responsible for? So today, the FAA is responsible for licensing commercial launches and re-entries with particular attention to the safety of the uninvolved public, so the people on the ground. When it comes to the people who are actually on board these spacecraft, that's a different situation. In 2004, Congress passed a bill that put the safety of spaceflight crew and passengers under the Federal Aviation Administration, but with significant limitations. The FAA could only regulate design features or operating practices that had posed a high risk or already caused a serious injury or death. As of 2023, companies are only required to provide basic safety training in the case of an emergency and receive informed consent to all associated risks of the flight. H.R. 5382 ensures that regulatory barriers will not hinder the growth of this emerging industry, will not force this industry to go overseas rather than provide the jobs here and the development of technology here. 
This is a very worthwhile piece of legislation. To vote against it is a vote to strangle this baby in its crib. The moratorium on regulating occupant safety is known as the learning period. Would you agree that less regulation in many respects encourages more innovation? Well, that has been the case, and I think the commercial spaceflight industry has benefited from that innovation. Certainly, we have taken advantage of that, and we have rapidly matured our technologies, and we have been able to you know, get to a point where you know, now, I think, is the time to start evolving to a more defined regulatory uh, regime and a set of standards moving out of the learning period. The learning period was extended three times, now expiring in October 2023. But among industry stakeholders, no consensus exists about whether Congress should end it or extend it again. This learning period that we've been in, why has it been important? Oh, it's been so critical to ensure that we have innovation continuing, and that's innovation both in vehicle design and continuing to bring vehicles online because we haven't seen all of the companies who are going to be engaged in human spaceflight launch yet, but also important in terms of allowing the safety environment to continue to mature. Mary Gunther is the VP of Space Policy at the Commercial Spaceflight Federation an industry advocacy group. In 2015, when that last extension was put in place, there was this vision that by now, by 2023, we would be much further along. We would have routine human space flights. And the reality is we have simply have not progressed as quickly as was envisioned in 2015. You don't want to write a regulation based on something that's happened only a handful of times. You want to make sure that you are writing regulations that take into account a number of different flights that have an appropriate sample size to develop the regulation in a way that is smart, that is informed, and that is actually taking into account anything that has been learned in that process. A 2023 report from Rand Corporation, commissioned by the FAA by law, analyzed the readiness of the industry for regulation. Douglas Lagore is its lead author. Congress asked us to really assess the readiness for regulation, and we essentially could not do that. We attempted to get information about the safety standards within the companies themselves, but representatives of the companies believe that that information is proprietary to the company and that they don't have to share it. And there's no regulation um, that requires them to, to share those safety standards. So for us, we couldn't independently assess whether those standards and the metrics that support them are you know, good, bad, or indifferent. So if I ask you, about Blue Origin safety standards or SpaceX's space safety standards or Virgin Galactic safety standards, you would essentially say, we have I no idea. I can't tell you. Yeah, I, we have no idea. Serious allegations of past safety practices and the workplace culture at Blue Origin. That's the space company founded by billionaire Jeff Bezos. Two years ago, 21 former and current employees of Blue Origin, including 13 engineers and technical personnel, wrote an open letter alleging Blue Origin was prioritizing speed over quality. The letter said in 2018, one team documented more than 1,000 problem reports related to Blue Origin's rocket engines that were never addressed. The FAA investigated these allegations and found no safety concerns, but there are no federal whistleblower laws protecting employees if they help the FAA. And emails obtained by CNN showed investigators were unable to speak with any engineers who signed the open letter. Blue Origin did not respond to a request for comment. Six months after the letter was published, George Neal, a former FAA associate administrator launched on Blue Origin's fourth successful crewed suborbital flight. From a customer standpoint, did you feel as though Blue Origin gave you enough information to understand the risk as well as the reward? Yes, so under law and regulation, they were required to tell me about the risks and the kinds of things that could go wrong. But I was very impressed with the, the knowledge and the capabilities and the aspects of the training. We went through the simulator dozens of times in terms of what the experience was going to be like, how to respond in the event of emergencies. And so I felt very comfortable by the time we got to launch day. Was there any point in the experience that you felt unsafe? No. Not one. Not one second. Not one second. But whether space tourists are ready for the risk, experts say a catastrophic event may be inevitable.
This played out in our research as well. Across the board, our interviewees were uh, relatively sure that we're going to have a bad day in space. And that is part of this domain because it is complex. It is dangerous, inherently dangerous. The consensus seemed to be that if there is a catastrophic incident, there is a real concern that there will be a regulatory reaction. Because the reaction would be a very quick turn, you'd likely get suboptimal regulation in those instances. Are you worried that a disaster would bring down the regulatory hammer harder than if you got on the front end of it? I think that's why the collaboration component is so important. We need to be thoughtful about how we're starting to shape the environment to move toward a future that has a more advanced safety framework, right? So that's why it's so critical to continue this government and industry collaboration. In July 2023, the FAA launched a rulemaking committee designed to help plan and implement future regulations for commercial spaceflight occupant safety. But while the government and industry stakeholders work to create a new safety framework, which may or may not include regulation, commercial spaceflight participants must fly at their own risk. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Dragon Capsule here in space. It's exciting. I was very proud to be the first person with a prosthetic body part to go to space because I feel that it's opening the door to more and more people. Because before me, the people who have flown to space truly were physically perfect. Did you know she's a real astronaut? Did you know? Oh, yeah. She's like, I know. Now there's more and more conversations about flying people who are disabled or have a complicated health history. With commercial spaceflight, one thing that I'm most excited about is seeing people with complicated health histories going to space. Three, two, one. Whoa. <laughs> it's not lost on me how fortunate I am to, to have had that experience, especially when I went to space, less than 70 women in all of human existence had ever been to space. And it's very wild to me that it's now gonna be opened up more and more and we're gonna see those numbers grow exponentially. And you think that's a healthy thing? I think it's a great thing.